Hey guys, we're going to talk about the physiologic integrity and therapeutic nursing interventions for our clients with uh, advanced musculoskeletal disorders. Okay, so as I go through this lecture, I'm, I'm going to tell you what type of injury we're talking about, and then I'm going to give you a little description of that injury and how we treat it. I know that in the past, I, I think when I did um, some lectures, even in women's health, and um, I did hematology this time, uh, this semester, I did not go, I don't usually do uh, anatomy and physiology, and I'm not necessarily doing that at this point, but I am going to describe that type of, of injury that we're talking about. <clears throat> I think it's easier to kind of understand if I do it that way. So a soft tissue injury sprain um, is it's an injury to the ligament, um, the structures and the joint. It's caused from twisting or wrenching motion. So if the person falls and they, they twist it, um, usually it's the ankles, the knees, the wrist. You probably see it when people step in holes outside. Uh, symptoms that you're going to see swelling, they're going to have extreme pain, and they're going to have decreased range of motion. We will classify it by degree of ligament damage, if it's mild, if it's moderate, and if it's severe. Treatment, rest. Rest is for 24 to 48 hours. We want to ice it. We want to put cold packs to decrease inflammation for the first 24 to 48 hours in 30 minute increments. Um, do not apply ice directly to the skin. That is important teaching that sometimes we forget to give patients, but we need to make sure that we let them know that when they're putting that ice pack on there, that there needs to be a barrier between uh, the skin and that ice. Um, and don't leave it on for greater than, uh, than 30 minutes. I know a lot of people will will try to try to put ice on and they'll want to leave it on for an extended period of time. <clears throat> Compression, uh, we want to we want to wrap it. We want to prevent edema. Uh, wrap it from distal to proximal. Elevate it for 24 to 48 hours because we want to we want to decrease that edema and we want to move the fluid from from that area of injury. A soft tissue injury strain is injury to the muscle or tendon from overstretching. It's usually large muscle areas, so the back, the calf, the hamstrings. Um, when you do a twisting motion with your back, um, uh, or you'll find that people will pick something up and they'll twist with their with when they're picking it up, um, and they stretch it out. They they just hurt that that back. Um, and that's just the first one I'm going with. Of course, we got the calf and the hamstrings as well. The symptoms you're going to see swelling, especially in the back. I don't know that you're going to see the swelling as much, but they're going to have some extreme pain. They're not going to want to move that, that back. And you might, you, there's a good possibility that you might see some bruising in that area. Maybe that, that just kind of depends on, um, the, amount of fat level back there for for some of us if you saw it with me you probably wouldn't see anything <laughs> it was it was big be, be down there uh, uh, under the the fat it's not going to come up i think we probably see it in the calf and the hamstrings just a little bit more um classified again by degree uh, of the muscle damage it's either going to be mild moderate or severe we want to rest it, the same thing, for 24 to 48 hours. We want to ice it. We want to do the same thing with the ice packs. And compress it, again, from distal to proximal. And elevate, if we can elevate, uh, if it's the back, we, we want to um, maybe position the patient with a, a pillow back in, in their back uh, so that they can sit up straight and not try to not bend over. Bending over tends to, to make matters worse. That means they don't want to end up stretching when they get up. Um, so uh, we just want to maybe put a pillow back there and have them set up straight and do the, the ice. A lot of people want heat, but ice to the muscle is the best thing. 
So let's talk about a soft injury, dislocation, and subluxation. Dislocation is the complete displacement or separation of the joint. Subluxation is the partial or incomplete displacement of a joint. This can result from a force that disrupts soft tissue support structures surrounding it. Um, the most common areas that we might see is the elbow, the shoulder, the thumb, the patella, and the hip. I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna bring my hips up for you to see. <laughs> uh, symptoms: deformity of the joint, pain and tenderness, swelling, and decreased range of motion. We're usually gonna have to diagnose this uh, by X-ray treatment. The goal is to realign the joint. A closed reduction under local anesthesia, conscious sedation, or general anesthesia. After the reduction, the extremity is to be immobilized through splinting or casting. Uh, management of pain is, is needed uh, post reduction. You know, if you don't manage the pain, patients are not going to want to get up and move around. It's just not going to happen. All right, so let's talk about the rotator cuff injury. I think if you hear anybody talk about the rotator cuff or you've, in, you've, you've been party to that kind of injury before, you understand it's a pretty painful one to have. Um, uh, the rotator cuff contains four muscles that are in the shoulder. It stabilizes the humeral head. Uh, it provides range of motion for the joint and rotation of the humerus. The tear may develop over <clears throat> a period of time from aging and repetitive stress or injury, usually like a sports with overhead rotation uh, of weight or weightlifting. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced an injury like this. I actually had, um, we, we suspected, I never had a full on diagnosis uh, that I possibly had a tear in my rotator cuff because right after I had lost a lot of weight I was going out and I was kayaking I, I don't do like heavy water kayaking you know fast water but I'll, I'll go out to lakes and and slow flowing rivers and other uh, other bodies of water and so that that motion of dipping the paddle down and and going back and forth um, over time, I started noticing that my right shoulder was, it was really hurting. I'd wake up in the middle of the night um, with pain. I had some limited range of motion. And so my physician told me that it really did sound like I had a rotator cuff injury, but he didn't want to, he didn't want to send me off to somebody because uh, he actually said that he had had one and he never had surgery for it. He just he just immobilized it and kept it immobilized and I did that for a period of time and um, I actually it it, it 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 became better so um, I don't have any problems with it <clears throat> but the symptoms um, severe pain when rotating that arm and decreased range of motion and weakness diagnosis is usually confirmed with an MRI scan All right, so partial tear or in the early stages, um, we're going to rest it. We're going to do ice again, and we also will do heat. So we're, we're going to alternate between the two. Uh, we want to provide NSAIDs uh, if it's not contraindicated for the patient. Uh, corticosteroid injections will inject and physical therapy. Um, complete tear or the late stage usually requires surgical intervention. I don't think I want the surgical intervention. If I can, hopefully, if I if it ever happens to me again, I can catch it in that early stage. Um, but when it when it's in that late late stage and or that complete tear, I don't know if you've seen people. Those are they are in some extreme pain. All right, so let's talk about a meniscus injury. A fibrocartilage cartilage is in the knee. It's associated with ligament sprains, common in sports injury with rotational stress on the knee. Um, I can tell you another thing uh, I found out from a family member. Um, she was jumping in the bouncy house with um, uh, a bunch of the 
you know, family kids that were at their house at that time. And she slipped and twisted that knee, ended up having surgery on it. So be careful if you're an adult for bouncy houses. Uh, this happened as an adult. It's degeneration also occurs in occupations requiring squatting or kneeling symptoms. The knee may feel unstable. It's popping. Uh, acute meniscus tear. You're going to have a local tenderness uh, with an effusion. Cold packs applied to the knee for 20 to 30 minutes. We want to immobilize that knee with a brace or immobilizer. Minimize weight bearing with use of crutches, physical therapy exercises, and then the surgical intervention might be needed. For my, for my daughter in Texas, that required a surgical intervention. Um, she said she never felt like such an old lady as she did at, at 28 years old right then. So um, it, it is quite painful. She, you know, it is quite miserable. I don't know. Again, I go back to that rotator cuff. I, I just remember just the partial tear and how that felt. All right. So the anterior cruciate ligament. Most common knee injury is the ACL. It's caused from pivoting, jumping, or decreased speed when running, a partial or complete tear or avulsion uh, separating the bone attachments that form the knee, the symptoms feeling popping, they have acute knee pain and swelling, and it may be confirmed with an MRI scan. So the meniscus tear with the, the ACL, uh, this is how the bouncy house, what happened with the bouncy house. Um, I didn't mention the ACL back in the other two slides because I knew I was coming up to this. Uh, treatment, rest, ice, ambulate with crutches. Effusion may need aspirated um, physical therapy to maintain joint motion and muscle bone. And then surgical intervention is usually required. It takes six to eight months to recover from it. It is quite an extensive recovery. That's why our athletes are, you know, if they tear an ACL, they're out for the season. Okay, let's talk about some bursitis. Inflammation of the bursa from trauma, friction, gout, infection, or arthritis. Uh, bursitis is also pretty painful. I guess all of these I, I keep saying are painful, but I just... Uh, um, they they all are. They're, the patient is pretty miserable with it. Just think about um, just, just think it, it's it's the it's like having an infection, but it's not an infection, but it's that inflammation of that bursa that causes so much pain. It's going to be warm to touch. They're going to have the pain. They're going to have swelling. They're going to have some decreased range of motion. Usually occurs in the hands, the knees, the hip, the shoulder, the elbows. We want to rest. That's the most common treatment. Immobilize the affected joint and apply the ice. NSAIDs for pain management and inflammation may re require aspiration of the bursal fluid um, and injection of corticosteroids. And sometimes they don't go right to, by the way, injections for cortic with corticosteroids. Um, sometimes they'll order dose packs of steroids for the patients to uh, kind of hit that area of inflammation. All right, so we're going to talk about fractures now. Open fracture, the skin is broken and exposing the bone. Okay, so we, we see here on my little picture. Closed, skin remains intact and no bone exposure. I will never, ever, ever forget. I was um, in Heber Springs and we had, um, my dad was camping and so we were up there visiting with them. My son was little at the time, maybe three years old, and we had had just this massive storm that came through. Um, and so uh, my dad had taken his awning and, you know, staked it down uh, and he had this rope hanging down. So my son um, was running back after the storm had ended but to his, where his dad was and he clotheslined himself. 
So his head hit the pavement. So we go to the ER and we're in the ER of uh, this, the little hospital in Heber Springs. It was before they built the one that they have now. And in comes this woman. And I'm going to tell you, there was a lot of people. It was amazing because the storm was massive and high winds. Electricity went out. It, it was just something now. Um, and so this woman came in and she had, uh, when the lights went out, she had tripped and fallen down her stairs. And when she did, she broke her, her, uh, her wrist and they left her sitting out there in the ER with just this handkerchief covering this open fracture. I mean, she had bone fragments hanging out of it. Um, it's not what we do. We need to cover it with something sterile. A complete um, is the break is uh, completely through the bone, uh, one side to the other. An incomplete, the fracture partially, partly across the bone shaft, the bone is still in one piece. Um, displaced, two ends of the bone are separated from one another. The bone uh, is not in alignment. Um, Non-displaced, uh, the periosteum is intact across the bone and is still aligned. Okay, so you all have the same PowerPoint lecture that I'm, I'm going off of right now. Um, and so you can actually look on your lecture, and you probably should, because if you hear something about the type of, of fracture, the direction, um, then you'll know exactly the picture in your head of what it is, because we have a transverse, it's going to go straight across. We have a spiral fracture that you see, it's at that angle. We have a green stick. A green stick is like a twist, but it, it's incomplete. You know, um, Let's see, let's liken it to, um, have you ever gone to pull <laughs> pull a switch off a tree? Um, and it's and it's a green, it's green. And so you, you try to try to break it and you can't get it broken. It's such a it's such a new piece of, of uh, uh, growth off of that, that tree. And so you try to you try to twist it and you get like this the splinter off. Um, but it doesn't break completely. That's what a green stick is. Uh, comminuted, um, as you can see on here, it's there's a lot of fragments in there. Um, the oblique, it's the fracture is there. It's in that line. You can you can see it. The pathologic, um, we have it broken, but it's also incomplete. It's also completely apart. And then you have a stress fracture. Stress fractures usually happen within that, that foot. You'll hear especially, and I'm not picking on overweight people because I'm certainly overweight myself, um, but a lot of times you'll find that nurses uh, end up with stress fractures, especially if we are, if we're carrying an extra load on us. Um, and it doesn't even, you don't even have to carry an extra load, but you'll see it a lot in, in our people that are, that are obese. They'll come in with uh, stress fractures because it's, there's so much pressure being put on that, that area in that foot. And so that happens because of all that extra weight. All right, so the clinical manifestations that we're going to see with fractures, uh, the symptoms we're going to see, we're going to have some edema, we're going to have some swelling there, we're going to have crepitus, we're going to have that popping sensation, and I, boy, I really wish I could put YouTube videos in here to show y'all. Uh, ecchymosis, where you're going to have that kind of discoloration of the skin, uh, where vessels have been burst, and, and that's where our bruising comes from. Pain and tenderness is going to be probably the chief complaint of the patient. Um, <clears throat> when there is a fracture, there's a, always some muscle spasm that goes along with it. So we, we typically find that that muscle spasm, um, you know, when they, when they have this, uh, in addition to taking care of their pain, and I, I know I'm jumping ahead of myself, but we'll have to give something for that spasm as well. I'll, I'll stop here because I, I know that I'm going down to the next slide. Sometimes in, in your brain when you're thinking about a lecture and you're thinking about uh, components, you, you kind of jump ahead. And that's what I just did on the, the muscle spasm. Um, they're going to have some deformity in that limb. You know, I'm trying to think of some kind of funky way to make a deformity. 
um, loss of function and shortening of the extremity. I know that when my my brother-in-law um, fell, at, he was at a skating rink with his kids uh, for a birthday party, and he fell and broke his hip. Uh, so he had to have that repaired and now he's got he walks because his he's got to have a shoe that fits and brings up the other leg for him because otherwise he walks like in this motion right here how are we going to fix it um, there's different treatment options and it's always going to depend on the type of fracture that it is <clears throat> we may have to do a reduction where it just restores the bone to the proper alignment, puts it back into place. Um, it's closed, uh, performed by manual manipulation. Open would be performed by surgical intervention. If we're going to do a fixation, it may be internal or external fixation, and it involves immediate bone stabilization. That fixation is really, it's, they really want to get it, that, that bone stabilized. Um, we also may put the patient in traction so that they have a pulling of force that's applied in directions uh, to reduce and immobilize that fracture. And then, of course, we're, gonna, we're likely going to cast it. It immobilizes the bones and joints in the correct alignment. Um, there's things that we're going to teach patients along the way. The biggest thing is about teaching So when we do a closed reduction, that it's non-surgical, it's a manual realignment of the bone fragments to the previous position. It can be performed with local or general anesthesia or conscious sedation. Uh, joints should be splinted post-reduction. I think if it were me, I would want some type of sedation because I don't want to feel it. Um, so. Um, Open reduction is going to be the correction of the bone alignment through a surgical incision. Usually includes wires, screws, pins, plates, rods, and nails. Um, continuous passive motion that CPM will be put to, uh, used to the joints to prevent extra articular or intra articular adhesions. We don't need those, we, it just compounds the problem. Okay, so we're, we're still talking about fixing our fractures. There's, there's different things that we can do. We can do an external fixation. And this is for when we need to, if we have an extensive break, um, that they're going to need something to fix this over a longer period of time. So you're looking at somebody with uh, pins inserted into the bone. These can be attached to rods to stabilize that fracture. Um, it, this is used for simple fractures or complex fractures with massive tissue damage. So I, I'm sure we've all probably at some point in time seen these types of, of devices. To me, they look <laughs> extremely painful um, and I'm sure they're pretty uncomfortable for the patients. Internal fixation, you're looking at something more permanent a patient that has needed pins, plates, rods, or screws into that area of the fracture. Um, this is surgically inserted to realign um, and just put back it that that um, that that bone back into uh, position. So this is our internal fixation. So. You can see on here that we are, and this is this is just two views of this this particular uh, foot and ankle. So you can see how they have bones, um, especially when they're fragmented and they need something in there to mo to mobilize that immobilize that that bone. Um, and this is one thing that they will use. Uh, a lot of times, um, I know for sure that. I don't mean to use myself so uh, I had a surgery on my on my foot some years ago and I have a, a screw in mine and a lot of times you'll see these patients over a period of time and this may be one of those uh, because it's putting some 
that person is putting lots of, of weight as they walk onto that internal fixation. And sometimes those screws will start to, to back out. I know what I'm trying to say, and I, I hope y'all are following me there. But those screws will start to try to, to back out of there. I have one myself, and it can be quite painful. Sometimes they may just have to go in and just have them removed. And at that time, if they have them removed, <clears throat> That bone has already, they've already had bone growing over that, so it would be okay to take it out. So here is the external fixation, which is it, it's not, as per, not permanent, but uh, is definitely needed for the patient to have some immobilization to that fracture. And you can see what I mean. It looks like it to me. It looks like it's extremely uncomfortable and extremely painful. And I, and I'm sure that it probably is. So now let's talk about some traction uh, for these fractures. It's the application of a pulling force, and it goes in in two different directions uh, to an injured body part or extremity. It provides proper bone alignment and reduces the muscle spasms. So let's say that um, if the, the arm needs uh, some traction, they'll put it in where it needs to be in alignment and they'll do the, the pull and it just, it pulls it out. It does what it's, and it, uh, it does that pulling force to that extremity and it really keeps it in alignment. Um, and I promise that that muscle spasm will start to relieve because when it's been fractured, that it's spasming around that, that all that injury. Um, and that it, the traction is a great thing to do that, to release, relieve those spasms. It's gonna be treated for uh, prevent or reduce pain in the muscle spasms and reduce a fracture or dislocation. And again, to immobilize the joint or that body part. There's different types of traction that we can use. There's, there's some short-term traction, skin uh, traction. It's used to reduce the spasms. It maintains alignment until the patient can have surgery. Uh, we'll do it with tape, boots, splints, or anything that is applied to the skin and pulls weight against it. Uh, Bucks traction, that's most commonly used with a hip or femur fracture. It's a boot that immobilizes a fracture and it prevents the hip contracture. So it, keeps the, it get, does that pulling force. And it also, again, decreases the muscle spasm. What we have to do as nurses is remember to assess the skin areas when we put this patient in traction. So skeletal traction is something that's more of a long-term thing. Um, it aligns the injured bones and joints through pulling motion with weight. Um, <clears throat> it may have pins or wires inserted into the bone. Uh, they have different types of Steinman pins, Halo, and Gardner Wells tongs. Uh, we want to monitor pin sites for infection and maintain sterile technique when cleaning them. It's vital that we do that. Nursing care of traction. We want to ensure that weights hang freely. We don't need them to touch the floor. It's counterproductive. Uh, do not remove or lift the weights without a, a physician prescription or order. Uh, place knots in the ropes to prevent the slipping. And then we have to check the ropes for patency. Ensure pullets are not obstructed and uh, the ropes can move freely. Um, we we just there's a lot to do to take care of those those fractures and I, of course you're not going to go into something just willy nilly and not know what you're doing. Um, but for for testing purposes, whether it's this or whether you're taking uh, NCLEX or ATI, you want to make sure that you know what you're doing to take care of this patient with traction. So when we're casting these fractures. Uh, these are temporary for immobilization used for closed traction reduction. Um, it's placed above and below the joints of the injury to restrict any movement. It's really uncomfortable. 
uh, made from plaster, it's synthetic, acrylic, fiberglass free, or polymer. And if any of you have ever had a cast, you know that I'm, I'm claustrophobic, so <laughs> I had a, a cast at my on my foot when I had surgery on it. And I, oh lordy, I was ready to cut that sucker off myself. <laughs> I think the next time that I, I saw the doctor, I, I was on my second cast. They put one on me when I had the surgery. And then when all the swelling went down, guess what? I could slip my foot out of there. And I did. I did slip my foot out. I was a terrible patient. And so um, he, when I went back in for another um, follow-up visit, he said, well, now that all the swelling's down, we're going to recast this thing. And I'm telling you, they recast it. And I had such restricted movement. I was freaking out. <laughs> Get me out of this thing. I'm sorry. I thought y'all might want to laugh right in the middle of this lecture. <laughs> all right. So we want to keep the cast and extremity elevated. Handle the wet plaster cast with palms of your hands and not fingertips because if you use your fingertips for cast when you're putting that cast on, then that patient's going to have those little fingerprint indentions um, and those are quite painful. Uh, monitor for circulatory impairment um, and monitor for signs of infection. What do we want to talk to our patients about? We want to instruct the client not to stick objects inside the cast. Um, that's not good. Uh, keep the cast clean and dry. Uh, there are some, and I think you can get them at Walgreens, but there are some arm and leg bags that you can use at, at Walgreens that has elastic around it. Um, and it, it, it pulls tight. I don't know if it'd work if it was an, a, an extremity like the 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 foot, ankle, or you know the leg. Um, but if it's an upper extremity, it's pretty easy to do because they could put their arm in that bag and not water wouldn't get through. We just want to make sure that when they're showering, they're not putting it down in the water and they're certainly not letting water go into it. We need to be very aware of neurovascular compromise. Um, and notify the physician immediately. If they have increased pain and swelling, discoloration, tingling, numbness, coolness, um, or you're noticing a decreased pulse, we really are assessing for that. Then we need to notify that physician. Um, and you pay attention to what your patient is saying. If they are telling you that it is hurting, it's hurting so bad, oh, 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 it's hurting. Um, you need to be paying attention because it, it may be that um, there is some impairment in there and we, we need to get that, that cast off. So some common types of fract, if, fracts, <laughs> types of cast. Um, there is a short arm cast, as you can see. I, I wish I could, I can point my, my clicker to it, but I, I doubt you see it. Um, as you can see, it's uh, you've got your fingers and your thumb that are still uh, usable. It doesn't go past the elbow. It goes right up to the elbow. If we have the long arm cast, again, you see the fingers in, are, are all out there, but it is going to go up and it's going to go above that elbow. It's going to immobilize everything from uh, basically the underarm down to the, the fingers. The long leg cast, again, we're going to, it's going to immobilize above the knee um, and it's, it's going to allow for the, um, the, the toe movement, of course, because that's how we're, we're going to need to assess for our, our patient circulation. Um, but it's, it's going to, it's going to keep it pretty still in there. Um, the short leg cast, it's going to go just right below the knee. And as you can uh, see on the, if you look on the short leg cast, there's a little, like it looks like a button on the back, bottom of it. Um, a lot of times when we have a short leg cast, as long as they can have weight bearing, then they can walk around with this cast on. So how are we going to take care of our patient? We know what we, we need to assess, we know what we need to look at, but 
they're also going to need some pain management. Um, we're going to look at doing muscle relaxants because guess, remember what I said, they are, they're going to be very prone to having uh, muscle spasms. So you're going to look at doing central and peripheral muscle relaxants. Uh, Soma is, is one. It's a great choice. A lot, as long as they're in the hospital and not going home, um, a lot of doctors will prescribe the Soma while they're in a the hospital. May, pre may prescribe it on the, for discharge, but it is definitely one of those medications that's on the list of, uh, of uh, you know, opioids or uh, types of opioid-like products that we don't like to prescribe anymore. A uh, flexoril and a robaxin are two pretty mild um, muscle relaxants that doctors really don't usually mind sending patients home with. If they're in the hospital, we're going to look at doing IV opiate medications for rapid relief. If the patient is eating, um, and able to tolerate foods, and we're going to likely give them an oral opiate um, and then some non-opiate medications like some NSAIDs. We also want to check their tetanus. When's the last time that they had a tetanus, tetanus shot? Because there is a high threat for tetanus and open fractures, um, so we might to get some prophylactic immunization for prevention. If they haven't had a tetanus in the past 10 years and they might not remember if they've ever had one, then we're going to see about going ahead and getting them one. Antibiotics uh, used as prophylaxis prior to surgery. Uh, well, cephalosporins are usually the most common that we'll do. Uh, Cephazolin, uh, or brand name is Ansaf, is the, the antibiotic of choice unless the patient has an allergy. So we, again, neurovascular assessment. We wanna do a peripheral vascular assessment. We wanna check the color. We wanna check their temperature of the extremity, not their temp. We need to do capillary refill. We need to check the pulse and we need to assess for edema in that extremity. Um, peripheral neurologic assessment. We want to check the sensory. Um, what about motor function and pain? You know, if we have a cast, I'm trying to get my, my camera here. So if we have a cast that goes up above the elbow and here they are like this, then we, we want to make sure that they've got some sensory function. Can they, can they feel in their fingers when you're, when you're touching? Um, how, do they have increased pain? Do they, are, are they able to, to move their hands? Because a lot of times if there is something that's going on way up in here, then they might not be able to move those fingers because um, that the movement, the range of motion is, uh, has been compromised. We'll look at arterial insufficiency. Is it pale? Is it cold or a cold extremity? What about the venous return? Is it warm? Is it is it at, is it a cyanotic extremity? We'll assess vascular dysfunction and insufficiency. Um, we want to make sure that there is not a diminished or absent pulse. So our nursing management control any bleeding with direct pressure. We want to elevate. We want to tourniquet. We also want to assess neurovascular status again, distal to that injury before and after any type of movement, such as splinting or, or transferring. Apply ice packs to the area prior to splinting and mark the location of pulses for repeat assessment. Boy, that's a big one right there. If I, if I had a, a, a patient with a fracture and I needed to assess those pulses, I am going to, is, I'm going to find out if I, I can find the, that pulse before the, cert, the procedure, and I'm going to want to put a little X on there with my permanent marker so I know where, right where to go back to. Splint the fracture uh, site, joints above and below the injury. Manage the pain and the muscle spasms. Monitor cast site or post-op site for bleeding and infection. 
infection is the most common complication of open fractures or if a patient is post-op from having a, a fixation done. Symptoms, they're going to have increased exudate, erythemia, a tenderness, and pain. All right, so cast care dues. Do do frequent neurovascular assessments and use the five P's. Elevate extreme uh, elevate extremity above the level of the heart. Rest it on a pillow. Use a hair dryer on cool setting for any itching. Uh, keep the cast dry. Cover it when showering. Monitor for complications such as if they have increased pain, burning, tingling, swelling, sores, or a foul odor. Odor. Cast care don'ts. Don't pull out any cast padding. Don't insert any objects inside the cast. Um, and don't cover with plastic for a long period of time. And don't try to get your extremity out of there. <laughs> so we might have to use some assistive devices uh, or, and, or have our patients too. With a cane um, that can relieve up to 40% of the patient's body weight. That's a pretty good amount. It's used on the opposite hand of the involved extremity. And you know, a lot of people, I think even us nurses, we want to put it on the area of the, the one that, that is injured. But it goes on the opposite side of that. You want to use it on the strong side of the body. That's important to remember. If they use a walker, it's used for complete non-weight bearing ambulation or gait assistance. Um, you want to remember to walk into the walker. Crutches, hate using crutches. <laughs> um, Non-weight bearing device, measure crutches uh, to be one to two inches below the, the axilla. Uh, this prevents the brachial nerve damage from happening. Um, it, it's really hard to, to me, I'm not coordinated to use crutches. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just really not coordinated enough. I ended up saying, no, I can't do crutches. I got one of those little willy things that I could put my knee on and <laughs> wheel around with that. Um, but we want to make sure, because not all patients can do something like that, but we want to make sure that we measure the crutches, that, like I said, one to two inches below. Um, involved limb is, uh, is to advance at the same time or immediately after the crutches. Uninvolved limb is advanced last. Uh, stairs, you want to go up the stairs with the good leg. Um, and down the stairs with the bad leg first. I know <laughs> it just doesn't seem right. Uh, and stairs are just hard to, to me again to manipulate with those crutches. Um, some people are, are probably a lot uh, more um, coordinated than me. I just couldn't, I couldn't manage it. I slid up and down the stairs on my booty. <laughs> I really hope that y'all are enjoying this lecture because I'm throwing some good stuff out there, I think. And again, infections, we have to look at that. It's a high risk in an open fracture and uh, with soft tissue damage. Open fractures often need debridement. Uh, the symptoms, if they are, if they're developing infection or have developed one, they're going to become tachycardic. They're going to run a fever. You're going to see erythemia and pain that's localized to that area. They're going to have an elevated ESR, uh, WBC, and leukocytosis. And they're probably going to end up with antibiotic ther therapy for three to seven days. It's really going to depend on the type of antibiotic or that they, the physician orders. So we need to talk about what could happen uh, complication-wise. Um, avascular necrosis could possibly occur. Um, that's when it that happens when the fracture interrupts the blood supply to the section of bone, and then the bone dies. Uh, the symptoms are pain with decreased sensation. 
we have to notify the physician immediately. Within our nursing world, there's nothing that we can physically do for that patient with that wound, other than we need to prepare for sur uh, surgical removal of that uh, necrotic bone. Okay, DVTs, another complication. Uh, the lower extremity and pelvis are highly susceptible to thrombus formation after fractures. Uh, the patho for it is the venous stasis becomes aggravated by inactivity of the muscles. And then we have de uh, decreased venous return to the extremity. The prevention treatment, uh, prophylactic anticoagulants, warfarin, noxparin, uh, rivaroxaban, I, I just probably just butchered that name. Um, but the anoxaparin is something, it, Lovenox is something we give, you know, it, I, I think that's a most common medication that's on a patient pro, uh, profile. Uh, we'll do sequ, uh, sequential compression devices or compression stockings as well to, to prevent uh, DVTs from occurring. Fat embolisms. Most common in the long bone injuries, such as in the femur, the pelvis, and in crush injuries. Uh, the pathophysiology for that, systematic fat globules distributed into the tissue and organs. And the fat from the bone marrow enters a system, uh, systemic circulation. It lodges into an organ and it causes ischemia and inflammation. <clears throat> The symptoms, usually within 24 to 48 hours post-injury, it, it occurs. Lung involvement, they're going to present with chest pain, respiratory distress, cyanosis, uh, tachycardia, decreased PaO2, uh, mental status change, uh, petechia or rash from the chest up to the neck. Uh, then it's gonna look like a snowstorm has ha is happening on their chest x-ray. <clears throat> the treatment is going to be early recognition and prevention, immediate immobilization of a fracture, and limited range of motion until it is splinted. That's the first thing that we can do. Uh, cough and deep breathe and supportive treatment of the symptoms. Compartment syndrome. Um, I, I alluded to this on talking about our assessments with, with CAST. Um, increased pressure within a limited space um, it is what happens and it com uh, compromises the circulation to the extremity. So it's really, it's getting tighter and tighter. <coughs> Results in nerve damage and possible amputation for the patient. It's common in the lower extremity and forearm fractures. So compartment syndrome is very rare. Um, what you're going to see is swelling. Uh, you're going to have tightness of this extremity, paralysis, pain not relieved with medications, decreased or absent pulses. <laughs> Patients will describe the pain. It's going to be a deep aching pain that they have. Um, they're going to have the numbness to, to there, so the paralysis. It, it is rare. Uh, treatment, uh, we'll get to that next. But this, it can last um, several months to years after it happens. Diagnosis, it is um, elevated intracompartment uh, pressure is what you're going to find. Um, Treatment is going to be preventative. We want to elevate the extremity and use, so, uh, use a soft cast. So in other words, a soft cast would be um, if there is a lot of swelling already with the extremity, then what we would possibly do is um, we would only cast maybe, let's say it was, let's do just the arm. So we would, we would create a cast from here um, to wherever we needed to go with that with that cast um, but it would not go it would just come up on both sides of the arm 
and it would not go all the way around. And then from there, we would wrap an ACE bandage around it. That way, when the patient is experiencing all of that swelling, we're not putting them at risk for developing, a, uh, developing compartment syndrome. Uh, we want to, if it if it is occurring, we want to make sure we remove a close to occlusive dressing if one is present on a wound. Loosen the cast to restore circulation. Never completely remove the cast. Uh, we don't need to do that. We're we're being counterproductive. We use cast, cast cutters to remove or loosen a hard cast, and a fasciotomy may be performed to relieve the pressure if those interventions did not work. Uh, <coughs> so even if you have a patient with a soft cast on, um, we we don't ever want to take off the the hard part of the cast if their their arm or their leg is in that, and we want to encourage them to not move that extremity out um, if we're having to loosen it. Uh, so here we're having to do a fasciotomy for the compartment syndrome. Uh, you know, I have all these pictures in here and I realize that's kind of difficult when we're doing a, um, a recorded lecture, but I do I do want to try to spend time when I hit these pictures talking about it, not just not just showing y'all and saying this is what it is. Um, but we had to on this one they have an external fixation device and they have had to open this this wound up or, or this leg up because um that it, that patient has experienced such extreme swelling in there we got to open it we got to make sure that that the swelling has a room to to grow and as it shrinks then we'll we'll put everything back together again it's kind of like when a patient has a has a head injury and they're swelling in their uh, in their brain so much that we need to give them give it extra room. Then what we would do is uh, maybe go in and and take out that part of the skull. You know, the top maybe take this part out so that that brain can can swell up. We'll protect it, and then as it goes down, we'll put everything back. So it's, it, along, it's along those lines. Okay, so a, a Colles fracture is the most common type of fracture in adults, and it's a fracture of the distal radius, usually from attempting to break a fall when the arm is stretched out. What you're going to see with this fracture is pain in the affected area with pronounced amount of swelling, an obvious deformity to the area. Um, major complication, vascular insufficiency uh, due to the edema. So treatment with uh, Colles fractures, we will. This patient will have a closed reduction of the fracture with splinting or casting. If it's displaced, it may require an external or internal fixation. We'll do neurovascular assessments and support and uh, protect that extremity. We want to encourage movements of the fingers and thumb. Uh, it decreases the edema and increases the venous return. You know, when you're when you're thinking of that type of cast, how their their fingers are, are open, we could even put a little stress ball into their their hand so that they can they can move their hand ever so often, have them to wiggle their fingers ever so often. So a humerus uh, fracture. Um, most common fracture in young adults and middle-aged adults, I almost sound like I was saying, this is a funny fracture. Uh, sorry. Uh, fracture of the humerus uh, shaft. Symptoms, obvious displacement of the humerus shaft, shortened extremity with decreased mobility and pain in the infected area. Uh, major complication is going to be radial nerve injury and vascular injury to the brachial artery. A treatment, it's going to be non-surgical, um, hanging arm cast or shoulder immobilizer. Now, they might end up having some skin or skeletal traction for uh, reduction or immobilization with that extremity. 
A pelvic fracture can be life-threatening. Um, this is that that's a serious injury. Uh, it depends on the mechanism of injury and the vascular damage that occurred with it. Uh, the blood loss from it, 1,500 mils to 3,000 mils. That's a lot of blood loss. Uh, it may cause a paralytic ileus, hemorrhage, laceration of the bladder, colon, and urethra. You can see how, I mean, that's an intense fracture there. Uh, symptoms are going to have intense, <laughs> do you like that, intense? Um, intense pain with tenderness. Deformity and unsteady pelvic movement and swelling and ecchymosis. You know, uh, back a few uh, slides ago, I was talking about a, an elderly woman that came in with an with an open fracture where the bone was sticking out of her um, uh, her hand. That same ER visit, and I forgot about it until just now when I'm talking about pelvic fracture. Um, there was a, a young girl and um, and they <laughs> it got me. So she came in for for pain. There I I saw a lot of, of people in that ER that day, and everyone was complaining. So I got to hear everybody's everybody's complaints and what was going on with them. But this young lady had been on one of those, they had been out in the, uh, on the water at Heber Springs. And so she was on one of those uh, banana boats that you pull behind the, the boat. Um, and she was on there with a couple other people. So the storm that I told you about was, had, was blowing up. So they were trying to get back to uh, shore as fast as they could, and something happened, and she ended up, um, you know, they were gonna fall, end up falling off, but she ended up, you know, on, so here she is, and here the person in front of her is, and she ended up sliding into them this way. Her legs went around them. Well, come to find out, she probably shouldn't have been on there in the first place. She had um, some bone, uh, some type of, I can't even remember what it was, but she had brittle bones in the first place. And so, um, I, she was probably about 10 or 11. They called her back and I saw her walking back there and I was like, oh my gosh, I bet she has a pelvic fracture. Sure enough, probably about 20 minutes later, they came, they came wheeling her out uh, and waiting for the helicopter from Children's Hospital to come pick her up because she needed to go immediately. I just remember them having her walk back there. So it was so horrible. Um, so anyway, that, that's just something that I remembered and I just, uh, I threw that out there. I, I don't know if y'all like my little stories occasionally, but sometimes it breaks monotony of hearing my voice, right? It's usually diagnosed by x-ray or CT scan. Treatment, if it's unstable, they're gonna stabilize the patient hemodynamically. Put a pelvic bi a binder on to control the pain and bleeding. Assess the bowel and urinary elimination. We're also gonna do neurovascular uh, status checks and then surgical intervention. If it's stable, we're gonna monitor neurovascular uh, status and 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 this can be up to six weeks so here's some some different types of, of fractures I'm I'm just gonna move move on with this one I mean you can you can see that this one uh, to the it's called the open book one you see how it's it's open there I would call this call the next one the closed book one but that's the open book at this time. Um, so now we're going to talk about some different types of fractures with the pelvic fracture. And this is a binder that's put on the patient. Okay, so there are the common fractures in adult, older adults, hip fractures. You know, this is... It's pretty serious for older adults when it happens. 90% um, uh, of hip fractures result from falls. 
uh, fracture of the proximal third of femur extending below the lesser trochanter. Symptoms, external rotation with shortening of the affected extremity, severe pain, tenderness, and then muscle spasms. Okay, so the medical treatment for uh, hip fractures, uh, it's going to be uh, use of maybe the Buck's traction. This could be applied for immobilization until the surgery uh, uh, to relieve pain and muscle spasms. Orthopedic injuries should be on a firm mattress with overhead trapeze for support. If you're not used to sleeping on a, a firm mattress, that could be a little difficult to get accustomed to. A surgical intervention depends on several things. The location of the fracture, the severity of the injury, and the patient's age. Um, that's really something that you kind of you kind of get into a place when you're thinking about that we don't do certain things because of a patient's age. It's really it's really sad, but um, you know, insurance sometimes feels like that. Um, they don't want to reimburse for a person who might not be here more than a year. I know it sounds terrible to say, but that's, that's another thing. Plus with one thing. And then also another thing to consider with the patient's age is the older they are, it, the harder it is for them to heal from massive major surgeries. Okay. So, nursing management what are we going to do preoperatively we want to give these patients pain medicines uh, analgesics and muscle relaxants we want to do immobilization of the extremity and position them for comfort post-op we're going to monitor their vital signs we of course want to do intake and output and we need to assess respiratory function observe incision for bleeding and infection assess and uh, and treatment of pain and spasm and of course we're going to do our neurovascular checks we've i'm not going to say it, it uh, it's like beating a dead horse i've already talked to you about that uh, but the biggest thing is going to be the trochanter roll um, you're going to use like a cushion or a pillow or some type of wedge uh, to hold the hip of the the patient in a neutral position um, it, and that's done because we want to prevent any external rotation of that, that hip. The femoral shaft fracture is a severe direct force to the femoral shaft. I mean, that, that sucker takes, it takes quite a hit to break that. Uh, displacement results, results in open fracture and increased tissue damage. It can result in severe blood loss of 1,000 to 1,500 mils. Symptoms, they're going to have some marked deformity, uh, angulation, shortening of the leg, and decreased mobility. And that angulation, is, it pretty, it's, it's kind of the, the fracture is, is displaced where like the normal axis or, or where the, the bone has been is altered in such a, a way that it, it's going in a different direction now. So that's what I wanted to let y'all know kind of what angulation was. There's different types of it for different part, different bones in the body, but um, it, it could cause that with uh, uh, the, the shaft fracture. Um, complications, fat embolism, nerve and vascular damage, blood loss uh, and tissue damage. Treatment, we want to stabilize the patient first. That's important. Stabilize them because remember, it can result in some blood loss, a lot of blood, severe blood loss, not some. Some indicates like a tablespoon. Um, this is a lot more than that. Immobilization fracture with the temporary traction. Uh, it can be a sagar, a sagar or a hair traction that, that is used. It does require surgical intervention, and we want to teach non-weight bearing ambulation, walker, or crutch training. And I thought that I would tell y'all, you know, I, I look up things ever so often when I, I'm going through a lecture, and I'm like, I can't, I don't remember what that was. Um, but the sagar, uh, uh, or hair traction, you uh, place or diligently shove 
one end under the patient's ischial tuberosity and strapping it in place. You attach the other end to the ankle and then you apply the traction in this manner. Uh, the SAGAR tra traction Um, anyway, the Sager traction is, is really pretty similar to the hair traction. Um, and probably if you're, if you're like a, a medic who's been out in the field as a, um, uh, in the Army, Navy, what, not Navy, but in the Army or Air Force, and maybe you've had to use that, um, for, uh, a, a patient out in the field or you know anywhere that that you are in a place where you have traumatic things that you're taking care of then you probably already know what a Sager or hair traction is um, but I just thought I would I would touch on that just real fast it's not like it's massive massive testable material but I I don't like saying things and and then expecting y'all to know exactly what it was Okay, so you can see here on the right side of your screen, uh, you have the hair tra traction splint, and that is for the displaced femur fracture. Fractures of the tibia is more common site, uh, more common site for a stress fracture. It usually requires force to produce that fracture. Complications, compartment syndrome, fat embolism, and infection. So what are we going to do for the fracture of the tibia? Uh, medically, uh, non-surgical, we could do a closed reduction with immobilization in the long leg cast. Surgical in, uh, intervention is going to be open reduction internal fixation with rods, plates, screws, or external fixation. Nursing management, we want an assessment of neurovascular status every two hours for the first 48 hours. Teach the patient crutch training. Usually it's non-weight bearing for six to 12 weeks. And again, you know, if you have a patient who's like me, who just, just does not feel coordinated to, to manage crutches, uh, don't, don't hesitate to uh, talk to them about the possibility of using uh, one of those little knee wheelie things so that they can, they can get around. They just put one knee uh, on it and they use the other leg to, to push themselves around it, it's just a it's just a thought just something to keep in the, your mind if you are ever an orthopedic nurse so with the crutch training the distance between the axilla and the arm pieces on crutches should be two to three finger widths I know I talked about this a little bit earlier the elbows slightly flexed when the client is walking if assisting the client to ambulate, the nurse should be on the affected side. Um, instruct the patient uh, to place crutches 6 to 10 inches in front of the, the feet. Most common is a three-point gait method. So, both crutches and the affected foot are advanced together, followed by the unaffected foot. Never ever rest your weight on the axilla bars of the crutches. That's important to note. Let's talk about some facial fractures. I can't imagine. Uh, so face is unprotected during rapid deceleration. Degree of injury is related to the force of the injury. Uh, can cause airway obstruction and death. Airway is always your first priority. This assessment is completed by inspection and palpation for movement of structures, frequently associated with traumatic brain injury. Um, and you have Lefort's classifications one, two, and three. I'll tell you, I, again, I'm, I'm really not trying to like use my personal life on here too much. Um, but sometimes the best patients are the family members that you have. So when my, when my daughter was seven and I had a car accident, she suffered a traumatic brain injury in that, that car accident. The, um, the side of the, the truck came in and popped her um, in her left temporal area. So it was a left temporal depressed skull fracture. So she also suffered some orbital fractures. Uh, there was nothing that they did to repair those. Those just had to repair on them uh, on their own. 
but I will, I wanted to, to bring it out because that facial fracture that she uh, suffered, to this day, she gets headaches in that area. And also, it was interesting that that bruising that was around there, it went away after, pro, I don't know, it seems like that it took a, a, about three or four months before all of this bruising went away. But the bruising up underneath her eye, that lasted and that state it was there a no lie the discoloration for a, a couple of years so la fort's fractures you have and i have to put my glasses on i've been trying to keep them off so that you don't see glare so when you have uh la fort one you can see that it's just right up under the the uh the bridge of the nose or right up under the nose not the bridge um, then you have left for it too which is takes it up from like the mandible over the nose to the other mandible uh, you have three that stretches from one ear across the eyes to the the other ear I know I'm using my hands and y'all can't even see what I'm, I'm doing I'm just describing and so, um, like, and I know y'all can see it, but, uh, okay, so amputation now is the removal of a body extremity by trauma or surgery. Some of the causes, peripheral vascular disease, trauma, thermal injury, tumors, or osteomyelitis. Diagnostics, we're going to do vascular studies to determine the circulatory status. We're going to do arteriograms, we're going to do a Doppler ultrasound, and we're going to do a venography. What are we going to do postoperatively to take care of these patients? We want to monitor vital signs and the dressing for hemorrhage, mark bleeding on that wound dressing. Anytime that you have bleeding on a dressing, you need to start marking it, date, time it. Uh, because as it spreads, you need to be able to note, note that it's spreading. Monitor for signs of infection. We want to look for fever, redness, swelling, or drainage. Wound care, sterile technique to decrease incidence of infection. Pain management, non-pharmacological techniques. Uh, we might try some positioning. Positioning is probably one of the biggest things that I like to do with my patients. Um, I would take care of patients who had mastectomies and you know they would complain of pain and I, I, it's not that I wouldn't treat their pain but I would note that if they were laying in the bed you know one arm was elevated and this this arm was was hanging down like this so I would take and put pillows under both arms to, to keep them both elevated uh, we want to we want to kind of do the same thing when we have a patient who has had an amputation. We want to look and make sure their body's in alignment, and we want to ensure that that we have uh, um, we can do things that with you know positioning that helps to take away that pain. We want to look at doing IV pain medications. They may even have a PCA pump, and then once they get off the PCA pump, we're going to move on to to the oral opioids. So evaluate for phantom pain and sensation. Use diversional activities and medicate as needed. I don't know that we want to medicate for phantom pain, but we want to try to help them to work through that, that phantom feeling. Uh, do not elevate the limb on a pillow. It may cause hip contractures. Keep the limb lying flat if possible. First 24 hours, elevate the foot of the bed to reduce edema. That's something that I see a lot with patients uh, when you go in the rooms that the head of their bed is elevated and their feet are still down and it's almost like they're, they're on a slope. But if we could just elevate and put them into a little, uh, I call it my little ba sandwich bed, uh, but put them into the sand, the, I was going to say the sandwich about you guys, but put them, you know, the elevate the bed so that they're not sliding down and not pushing, putting pressure on everything else. After 24 to 48 hours, clients may lay in a prone position to stretch and prevent any hip contractures. Do not allow residual limb to hang over the edge of the bed, though. 
teach a client to not sit for long periods of time. Uh, may massage a stump to promote circulation. Um, wear a limb sock uh, uh, under the prosthesis. Compression bandage needs to be used to support the soft tissue, reduce edema, decrease pain, and promote limb shrinkage. Crutch trainings as soon as the patient is physically capable. Patient education begins prior to sur surgery up till discharge. Uh, we want to talk about the phantom pain. We want to talk about prosthetic sizing and use and diet and exercise. I don't know that we can do prosthetic sizing and use right immediately after amputation because what do we have? We have a lot of edema in that, that, uh, that stump. So they're going to have to wait for a certain period of time and, and we'll have individuals who take care of this who can talk to them about that. Uh, joint surgeries, arthroplasty, a reconstruction or placement of a joint common in osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, avascular necrosis, and congenital ne deformities. Common at arthroplastic surgeries, hip arthroplasty, that's where we're going to do a total hip replacement by replacing the ball and socket joint along with the upper femoral shaft. Hip resurfacing, reshaping of the femoral head and a capped with a metal prosthesis. Knee arthroplasty, we're going to do a total knee replacement with metal or prosthetic device. And then a finger joint. We're going to do a, do a silicone uh, rubber arthroplastic device. Okay, so post-operative management. We want to assess nerve function and circulatory status frequently. Pain management. Uh, immediately after surgery and maybe for one day after, we're going to either have epidural, intrathecal uh, pain management, nerve block, or a PCA analgesic. After that point, we're going to start moving that patient to oral stero uh, steroids, not, it's not steroids, steroids, or oral opioids and NSAIDs. I feel like I'm standing in front of y'all trying to lecture because I'm just like all over the place. And I've already erased this slide, I think, twice. <laughs> Wound care, sterile dressing changes, monitor for signs of infection, early ambulation is highly encouraged. Antibiotic therapy for infection prevention. We want to also have thromboembolism prevention, anticoagulation, anticoagulation therapy, <sighs> warfarin and heparin, or sequential compression devices, or both, actually. Uh, they may have the CPM, the continuous uh, passive motion, um, and of course we're going to get physical therapy going with these folks. That's the end of my lecture. I, I hope that you've taken the time to, to listen to it. Um, if it were in the classroom, it would have been a three hour lecture and I have gotten it out in an hour and a half or almost a half. So that kind of gives you some time back so that you're listening to the lecture, okay? Um, I hope to see some of y'all soon and y'all have a, 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 a good time and, and work, work hard and I don't know what else to say. It's just that I miss my students. Um, so uh, enjoy. <laughs>